What can I do for you? So, so I've written this line in the script where I say Mercedes, eh? And it turns out that that triggers Hi Mercedes, which has screwed up my script completely. Well, the start of it anyway. Oh well, I'll do it anyway. Could you repeat your input, please? <laughs> uh, you're probably not the only one saying that. Mercedes, eh? What's it all about? Oh. A boot? What, what is it all about? Oh, about. Sorry. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult to understand the, uh, the Geordie people. It's a good question, though. You see, in the air, I was born not that long ago. Sure. <laughs> Mercedes sold five cars and a van, three saloons, an SL and a G-Wagon. Kind of simple. Today, Mercedes makes so many cars that you can quite feasibly knock your thumb trying to count them. See? And some of them, right? I honestly don't think they're any different. Like this four-door saloon based on the A-Class, and this four-door saloon based on the A-Class. And to go further down this rabbit hole, there's this SUV based on the A-Class, this estate based on one of the four-door saloons that's based on the A-Class, this small MPV based on the A-Class, this SUV based on the small MPV based on the A-Class, and of course the thing that started this all, the A-Class. Why am I telling you that? Well, it's because at some stage over the last some years, Mercedes started making so many cars that it ran out of letters for them all. So it did something called model rationalization and realignment. Or in non-dickhead speak, it changed the names a bit. And the chief beneficiary of this nomenclature harmonization, eh? was and is the SUV. So if it's got a GL at the front of the name, that means it's an SUV type car, and then the third letter denotes the size. Ergo, GLA, A class, GLB, B class, GLC, C class, GLE, E class, yes. And also, there's one up from this, so let's see if you've been paying attention. Correct, or not, I don't know. I tell you what, let's get round to reviewing the actual car now, eh? <laughs> is effing massive. Seven seats big, in fact, so I can tell you that practicality is phenomenal for no other reason than its epic proportions. Nothing clever about that, but let's go through it anyway. So at this price and shape, you are looking, of course, at the usual SUV style suspects. And I mean, honestly, right, we could shoegaze for literally minutes over the details of space and spec and all that stuff on these things, but they all do pretty much the same thing. As in, be much more massive and terrifying than most of the cars and cost 50, 60, 70 grand. I guess it is worth saying at this stage though, that this and the X5 and the Range Rover Sport make you pay extra for the sixth and seventh seats, whereas the other ones give you them a standard. It's pretty much a grand per seat for the extra ones and they are absolutely minuscule. And just for context, here is another Mercedes chair that you can buy for the same money. A chair that I would be very willing to sit in and talk about one day in front of camera, you know, if you're watching Mercedes. Anyways, if you need the little chairs, they are there and they are standard on the higher level stuff. Not worked into the price or anything. Either way, five seat or seven seat, this is as big a boot as you could possibly want or need this side of a van. Also, there is absolutely loads of rear leg space. And so much headroom that when I first took the family out in this, my missus turned and looked at me from the passenger seat, burst out laughing and said that I looked absolutely tiny. Mm. Yeah, I'm gonna do the joke. There's plenty of room in my trousers. Sadly. <laughs> so yeah, it has more empty space than a Katie Hopkins house party and you pay a lot for it. You probably could have guessed that stuff by just looking at this thing, right? It looks massive. But what you wouldn't have guessed is that this thing is also a little bit uncouth. Hmm. We'll come back to that. Just to put the icing on this particular consumer cake, the GLA offers surprisingly little choice when it comes to engines and trim, which in itself is a good thing. One trim, called AMG line, and four engine choices, three of them diesel and one petrol. Also hybrid, coming to the UK very soon. And balanced that way because in a car this size, diesel still does make much more sense than petrol does, not least because of the massive tank range that it gives you. At this end of the market, it's often less about cost 
and more about the convenience of not having to go to the petrol station every five minutes. Also, you'll see that the performance difference between the top end diesel and the petrol is negligible, really, on paper at least. But I wouldn't get either of those and nor would I get the base model one, which is the only four cylinder one you can get and which happens to be the one that I'm driving today. I wouldn't get this one because this engine is just too course for a car like this. It really bursts the refinement bubble because it always feels like it's straining against this car, the sheer weight and heft of it. It does give you decent fuel returns though, so over the last week with this car, I've got about 35 miles per gallon out of it, and that's been a decent mix of motorway and around town stuff. It's not too bad for a car this huge. It's also really, really refined on the motorway, but that is largely to do with the nine-speed gearbox. Very lovely nine-speed gearbox it is too. So if you're in top gear, a place I long to be, what was I saying? Oh yeah, top ninth gear, right? So you're doing 60 to 70 miles per hour and it is pulling well below 2000 RPM. And that means that you just can't hear the engine taking over really. It's kind of drowned out by the tire noise and the wind noise, even though there's not much of that either. Problem comes when you start accelerating and it begins to sound like the proverbial bag of nails. Engine sound. It's just not very nice. This gearbox, right, with its seamless shifting and its seemingly infinite number of ratios, attached to this grumbly four-cylinder diesel engine, feels like having wireless charging on a Nokia 3310. It's an incongruous mix of old school and new school. Speaking of which, only yesterday I got to drive the Mercedes EQC for the first time, which is the electric 4x4 that they're doing now. And actually, regardless of what I'm about to say about which engine you should have in this car, driving an electric SUV just makes all internal combustion stuff feel old hat, old tech. Technology. No matter how powerful your engine, how much torque it has, it still has to spool up a bit, which an electric car just doesn't. You get that instant response. Driving this car and that car sort of back to back, and you are going to see the video of that car soon, does make you understand exactly why electric cars are the future. And so, putting electricity to one side, I'd recommend this one, the 350D. This is a car that is begging for a six cylinder engine. And that's because it is very clear what Mercedes has benchmarked this car against. That's right the good old Range Rover. And why not? Because that's the default choice of this type of car. I dare say that no matter what you're watching this on, if you look up from your screen now, you will see a Range Rover of some sort. For me though, Mercedes hasn't quite got this right, okay? Don't get me wrong, right? Most of the time, this is a very, very luxurious thing to be in for various reasons, but I think they've set it up just a little bit on the wrong side of too soft. There's a little bit too much body movement no matter what you're doing and where you are. So if you're on a typical back road, it's all over the place. If you're on the motorway, it's generally fine, but you hit an expansion joint and there just seems to be this like slight aftershock effect. It's not quite settled down enough. When you put the brakes on, there's quite a lot of forward pitch. It's kind of squishy, which makes it comfortable most of the time in a traditional sense, like a soft armchair, but it's comfortable in a fairly unsophisticated sort of a way. Now it does have driving modes of course like most of these cars do and that includes adaptable suspension but it doesn't really solve the problem. If you put it in a sport mode it just makes it a bit more juddery. It doesn't actually seem to affect the body roll that much. And that brings us on to the fact that you know, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. This is not a sports car. We don't need to talk about how this thing handles. But this is the SUV compromise all over, isn't it? It's really difficult to make something this bulky and this vast and this tall ride with the sort of smooth comfort of a... Ride with the sort of smothering comfort of a luxury saloon, which is still the shape of car that you should be getting if ride quality is your top priority. Good ride quality, that is. What I do not have any complaints about is the cabin of this big fella, which is just a lesson in quality and clean aesthetics and intuitiveness. It starts with this widescreen twin display thingy, which almost completely declutters the cabin, but which is also generally as massively impressive as it is massively massive. The amount of information it's capable of displaying could and should be mind boggling, but somehow Mercedes has managed to display it all in a really clear, intuitive way that's non-distracting. There are also four ways that you can control it. So you can touch the screen, you can touch this pad down here, you can thumb this tiny little pad here, or you can talk to it. Seriously, right, talking to this car and making it do stuff never gets old. Check this out. Hi, Mercedes. What can I do for you? Open the sun blind. Okay, I'm opening the roller sun blinds. Hi Mercedes. How can I help you? Turn the temperature down. Temperature is 17 degrees. 
The temperature thing, right? So that's another little surprise and delight feature of this cabin. So if you knock it up, all the ambient lighting turns red briefly, and if you knock it down, it all turns blue. Little stuff like that just makes this car feel lush, you know? And the head-up display. So I've used quite a lot of these things before, but this is by far the brightest and the clearest and the biggest one that I've ever used. And it can show you loads of different stuff. So actually, you never have to look down from the road ahead. And I'm still really amazed by the augmented reality sat nav. I've used it in the A-Class before and I did mention it in that video, so I'm not going about it too much. But basically, it integrates the camera so that it overlays where you're supposed to be going onto an actual image. It should be really distracting, but it's not. It's brilliant. And it's especially useful on roundabouts when there's quite a lot of turn-offs on it. Also, right, you can use your seat adjustment controls to control the passenger seat, which is never not funny when you've got somebody sat there. They see me trolling, they hate it. And on top of that, it is, of course, ergonomically perfect, while also giving you that lovely high-riding SUV thing of feeling like you're on top of everybody else. Sadly, the head-up display and augmented reality sat-nav are optional. It'll cost you about 1500 for the pair inside a pack. I can't remember what it's called. But whatever it's called, it's money well spent. But even if you don't go mad with the options list, which of course you can and which will cost you a fortune, it's just lovely and it overcomes any frustrations that you might have with a slightly turbulent ride quality. What I would say and what is ultimately really important is that the GLE is right up there at the top of a class that is consistently brilliant. The Audi Q7 and the Volvo XC90 in particular are fantastic in their own ways. The Volvo for its beautifully relaxed ride quality and the Audi for its fantastically high tech cabin and saying nothing of the GLA's off-road ability I don't care about that and nor will you most probably I would definitely rather have one of these than a Range Rover Sport and we'll leave it there I think if you want to go deeper into the specs and things on this car there's a review on the HJ website as always so I'll see you next week I think I'm doing a hybrid Mondeo exciting in the meantime please look at our other reviews and if you don't like what you see please leave something really hurtful so that I can put it on Twitter because it's just easy likes for me Thanks a lot. See you soon. Bye.